Okay, let me just set this up. Welcome everyone that has attended this meeting. We're, we're essentially going to give it up to a little bit of 1202 before we kickstart this, but welcome Anna and Jared to the platform right now. Make sure this works. Just a few more seconds. Welcome, Ken. Welcome, Gesla. All right, Tim. Oh, Justin popped in as well, too. Well, I mean, before we even get started with this, I want to say thank you, everyone, for attending this talk of Measure Twice Code Once, a guide to performance management in .NET. Um, I think we'll basically kickstart this. It's 12.03 now, so I think it's a good time to start. So. Welcome everyone. I am definitely pleased to introduce Tim Rayburn. You know, with over 20 years in software development, he's a leading figure at improving enterprise and a key contributor to the Dallas Fort Worth developer community. He has expertise spanning from .NET framework to HIPAA guidelines to agile leadership. And so today he's going to share insight on coding performance in our cloud-driven landscape, drawing from his extensive experiences and commitment to the field. So Tim, you have the floor for this. Awesome. Thank you, Henry, very much. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining today. Um, as Henry mentioned, this is a little bit about me and who, what I am and what we, we're going to, we're a little bit about the things that are I am passionate about in my life. Our goal today is to talk about performance measurement. And this is a ridiculously deep topic. And so we're going to touch on some really important high points as we go through this, setting the groundwork for what I hope will be a, an ability for you to see success um, and you know help make sure that we do probably the most important thing and topic in the cloud space today, which is cost containment, right? How can we be smart about the cost of things that we do in the cloud because of the fact that all of that is charged per CPU, memory, and, and kilobyte. And so we need to be intelligent about this. The day of, oh, I've got a massive server back there, and and you know, as long as it's not at like 90 plus percent all the time, then everything's good. That doesn't work. We're going to be working in more constrained environments most of the time. So this is a little bit of an agenda about what we're looking to to talk about today um but it looks like henry might have a question already no oh sorry it i forget to put this in really quick tim sorry the disruption on it but i just want to make sure everyone knows about this is that there is like a qa section where you can ask all of your questions so anytime you have a question just feel free to put it in here and i can immediately talk it to tim on it and also there's a lobby chat where you can put your questions there as well yes. sorry tim uh no, right back fine. at you again Okay. Um, so we're going to talk first about what is performant code, right? Um, because it's a very interesting topic. And then, you, then we're going to talk about how fast is fast. You'll note I brought a, a slew of friends along with me here who are all, you know, all known for being fast. Um, okay. And so uh, we're going to talk about how fast is fast, how, what, how, how fast is fast enough. And then we're going to talk about, a good bit of time on what I consider the minimal acceptable tooling that you should bring when you're targeting to try to just monitor and be aware of performance as a whole. And then finally, we will get to a section where we do talk about measuring performance at a, at a granular level. And so with that, we're gonna go ahead and dive in. Let's talk about what is performance code. 
So when we're dealing with code, we're always trying to balance things. We have to balance at all times these three criteria. We need things that are both correct, we need things that are efficient, and we need things that are maintainable. And all three of these things go into the overall cost of code. Um, obviously, code that does not do the job correctly is going to have to be touched, and code that has to be touched costs money. So correctness is a key factor. Um, on the other hand, you also want code by preference that can be efficient. And when we talk about performance code, this is where most people focus. They focus their attention on, I want efficient code. And that's true, we want efficient code. But we also have to remember that if efficient code comes at the cost of correctness, or as it way more often does, comes at the cost of maintainability, then it may not be a trade that's worth it. Because the third leg here is maintainability. How easy is it to maintain this code? I uh, have been a part of projects for years and years that have had sections of the source code that are documented with comments at the top, like, here be dragons, be careful, don't change this, uh, don't change this without talking to people. Um, I, I remember walking into one client and seeing a comment at the top of a file that said, uh, if you try to modify this and fail to do so, please update the counter in this comment for how many times it has been tried and failed. And there was already over a hundred attempts to make that particular code better, all of which had failed because they had fallen down on correctness or had lowered the efficiency in the process. So, Maintainability is important. And if I'm going to get relatively minor performance changes for at the cost of making the maintainability of the code notably harder, that's almost never worth it. The uh like the classic example in .NET is I could work exclusively with uh the raw data type of an array anytime I had multiple things. But while a list or an enumerable of some sort uh, that is a higher level object that, you know, a list or a collection or things like that, dictionaries are, are technically less efficient than an array, uh, they are much more maintainable. And most code will uh, that you run into in the wild will happily take that trade off and say, nope, we've opted to use lists, to use collections, to use dictionaries because of the fact that the maintainability of the code is more important than the raw efficiency of the code. It used to be that in uh, the gaming space, you'd hear, you hear gaming as the, as the hallmark of, of course, we'll take efficiency over maintainability. And that's still true in the 3D graphics realm of gaming. But uh, most of their game logic is now written in C Sharp or other higher level languages because of the fact that maintainability was more important in those situations than the raw efficiency of working with C++ or the equivalent and being able to get very low level access to things. So Performance, you need to define what it means to you. You need to look at your project and be realistic about what it means. It does not make sense to delay or cause the development cost of your project to increase by 20% in order to do even a 20% reduction in hosting costs because the people costs of the development effort far outstrip what it's going to cost to continue to main, uh, to pay for the hosting in, uh, in the cloud. So you have to really start getting to the, to the nitty gritty of what's worth it. Now let's talk about how fast is fast. Um, I when I first did this talk, I didn't include this this slide, and I found it 
interesting that I had after uh, conversations after the talk with several people and I realized, oh, I'm being an old gray hair uh, when it comes to assuming that everyone has native understanding of this because a lot of people, even software developers, don't have a natural understanding any longer about what, what are the fastest things that a computer can do. So the strictly fastest things that a computer can do are operations that include only the CPU or the GPU, pure mathematical operations, uh, pure vector calculations for uh, the GPU, and that they're done based on work or based on data that is already loaded into the memory of those CPUs and GPUs so that they're blazingly fast. Now, if there are very few things that get to operate at just that level, the next step out is to start looking at what, in, what has to involve main memory. Main memory is still very fast, but it's not as fast as being loaded into a CPU register for getting the, getting the work done. Then after that, you get to, it's not main memory, but it's an SSD, a solid state disk that's on the physical box that you're interacting with. That's where our, our phones live, right? That's where uh, the most of our computers live for their main, main storage these days is to have, uh, have something that is faster than a uh you know faster than the spinning rust of disk operations out here but still still slower than main memory now this is where the the it's interesting because of the fact that the technological advancements over my career have reordered the back end of this thing, these things um networks have continued to get faster and faster and faster and so at this point most network operations are faster than actual physical hard disks that are have spinning rust doing that doing their thing you know, spinning spindles of uh, of drives and uh so when you're next looking to do that jump and jump across to a network right if if you need data from a sql server you are at minimum you're going to be taking taking things down to network speed. And network speed is still very fast. It can be measured in milliseconds, but you know, many of the other things on here can be measured in nanoseconds. So this is definitely a a space where you've slowed down. You've slowed down notably. Um, and then if you're reaching out to that SQL server and it's not going to solid state drives, then you're probably sliding out to reaching across a network to a uh, a set of hard drives that are uh, doing the doing the main storage in your NAS or SAN for uh, for your SQL Server, and so things are yet slower. Okay, um, and this is important to know this broad scheme because when we're talking about performance, you need to remember how fast can I be? If you are comparing the mathematical cal calculations of a GPU versus the, the calculations of a matrix of nodes that you've received from a SQL server, you're, the fact that you have to ask the SQL server for that data is the long pole of that request. It doesn't matter how efficient you are once you retrieve it, your cost to get the data is the most expensive part, all right? And so we have to know how fast can I be? What is the fastest I reasonably can expect? And then my business logic, my complexity is going to add to that floor. And the really that's about how far along this spectrum am I in trying to understand uh, stand the performance and uh, understand how quick I can be. All right.
Now let's talk about what is fast enough. And this is interesting because of the fact that um, we're going to talk a little bit about how consultants get engaged when people have performance problems, because that's definitely something that is a notable portion of my job is to come in and help people when they are having performance problems with code. And the reality is that I most often get engaged when we have a situation where there is a performance problem, but the client has no idea how to fix that performance problem. And as such, they're out here. And so they have the awareness that they have a problem. They are not in the unknown side of awareness, but they are on the unknown side of the knowledge of how to fix things. And my job is to come in and help them transition from this quadrant to this quadrant, where they both know that they have a problem, which they did when I arrived, but now they also know how to fix it and know how to make things better. And so this makes sense. This is, let us help, let me help you grow your knowledge. Let me help you understand what it is going to be like to fix this. The downside of this, and the thing we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today is I'd like to point out everything below the x-axis here. This space where you don't know that you have a problem. You don't know that there is a performance problem because you lack awareness. The, the reality is, is that most of the time, it is users who are informing people that things are slow. Most software developers do not spend enough time working with the system they're developing in to notice slowness themselves. They produce a product that they never use. And it, I find it interesting. This is something that, that we've pointed out for years as a developer community to Microsoft, as an example, that they don't use the tools they build enough to really understand what it's like. And it's part of the reason why Microsoft in the, la in the last years has been so focused on using Azure for everything they do internally because they really want to be the world's biggest consumer of Azure. They want to be uh, the dog fooding, the eating and understanding their own product so much that they can understand the sharp where the sharp corners are before their customers come. They're working on understanding what is below here. They're trying to raise their awareness level. So we, how do we get awareness? How do we know there's a performance problem before we're told by a customer that there is a performance problem? That is what we really need to get to an understanding of. Now, before we talk about how to, to do that, though, we need to remember that performance is an infinitely deep well. There is always faster. There is always better. So as you walk into efforts, please remember to put time boxes around the amount of effort you're going to put into trying to make things more performant. Because it is very easy to spend way more time solving a performance problem than solving the performance problem will ever make to your customers. So time box your effort, be reasonable about your, your expectations and, and make sure that you're pragmatic about where you're applying the guidance we're about to get into. That said, all of that boils down to a great quote I got years ago. I think it was Tech Ed so many years ago when, when Tech Ed used to be a conference that Microsoft threw. And I got to hear the esteemed Juval Lowy uh, give a talk. And he said, remember that good enough is by definition good enough. 
And you will be surprised the number of development teams who will balk at this statement. They'll go, no, we need to be better, faster. It's like, no, good enough is good enough. Okay. We need to understand what acceptable performance is and we can stop at acceptable performance. If we can easily exceed acceptable performance, fine. But when I say easily, I mean like no effort, literally no effort to do. Because otherwise, let's get past this and get to the next business value thing. Because very few pieces of software are sold and win customers exclusively because of their performance. So good enough is by definition good enough. All right, tooling. So everyone here is a software developer, I assume. And as such, you write code. And yet I am constantly amazed how often I will arrive at a client's site and they have nothing set up. They're like, performance is bad. How do you know? Customer told me. Okay, where in your code is the performance problem happening? And they're like, we have no idea. In 2021, I arrived at a client uh, in Dallas and asked and was told, hey, we need to rebuild the, our entire company's core system. The entire way we make money, we need to rebuild it. Why? Because of the fact that the way we're currently doing it is ridiculously slow. Okay. Why don't we just make the existing one faster? Answer because nobody knows where it's slow. Each individual piece of the workflow points at another one and says, they're the slow one. And I'm like, what does your logging tell you? What do your metrics tell you? And they're like, yeah, we don't have any of that. See, this is where, when we're dealing with performance problems, there are minimum things you should be doing. And if you're not, you're just asking for performance problems in the future. You're asking for big problems when you can be prepared for so little effort, you can be prepared. And the first of those is structured logging. This concept of, I want logging that is not just a, here's a line of text, but that includes data elements that I can query about, that I can investigate and ask my log tools about, this concept of structured logging is so easy to implement. You throw a handful of NuGet packages in and you wire up like six lines of code and you get structured logging built into ASP.NET just like that. So I have here in my slides provided a Docker statement for how to run a package named SEC. SEC is good. It's lightweight. That's the reason why I'm using it here. There are lots of things that will gather and consolidate your structured logging. SEC is just one of them. In this particular case, as you can see by the NuGet packages I'm saying to install, which is a using a NuGet package named Serilog, I'm plugging Serilog into ASP.NET. I'm outputting it to the console. I'm outputting it to a local file, and I'm outputting it to our friend SEC here. This is a reasonably good one, two, three. You don't want to just do sec. If sec goes down, you're going to miss things. You need you need fallbacks. And when you're in the debugging process, you need to have it output to the console. So that's good. Okay. But all of this is very simple to do. You just throw these lines in. Now, what does the code look like to do that? If we, I have this Docker running already. I've executed this Docker command. So it's running on my box. I'm gonna jump over to Visual Studio. And in Visual Studio, this project right here called Measure Twice Code Once is a file new ASP.NET API project. It has the weather forecast controller. And the only thing I've done is add a single call to the logger. Just for the record, it actually already comes wired with a logger. You can do this. I've just said, hey, log the weather data as it comes through this, this controller, simply so that I had something explicitly logged that was done. But this is how I log a statement. How do I get this wired in? 
I simply come in and say on line 18 that I would like to use Sarah Locke. And that's it. I come in, say, please use Sarah Log, And then up here on lines six through 12, I told the logger that I wanted to pull from the log context out to the console, out to a file, and out to sec at this address. So we're looking at essentially six lines of code to be able to get structured logging implemented. And when you do that, then you get experiences like this, which is we can warm this up. Uh, continue with debugging. Forgot I was in release mode. There we go. All right. So I have implemented Swagger here so that we can invoke this API endpoint. And I'm simply going to come in and say, I would like to try it out. That I would like to execute this endpoint. And when I do, I get information out here about what is going on. Now, if I switch over to my browser, where I have sec running, I can now say, hey, sec, show me what's been sent. And you will see I have a large variety of things that were logged for me by ASP.NET. As soon as I plugged it in, it was like, OK, you want a logger? Here it is. Uh, but I specifically want to point out when we get into this call right here. This is the reported the weather item. And you'll note that we have all of these data elements that were included. The beauty of our, our use of something like SEC is that we can query now into this based on what we see here. So for instance, I could say, I want to look at this where action ID is equal to this particular action. And then query that. And then these are all of the particular uh, log statements that were made just in the execution of that action. When we matched the route, we executed the action, we reported the weather, and we've wrapped it all up. I was able to call down to what I needed very quickly because all of them contain that action ID, the same action ID that was included. And so this gives us so much more power than flat file logs do, than console output does. And it costs very little to just put in the ability to have this and when you do this, all of a sudden, you get really interesting things. Like, you'll note that by default, on this out this event right here, the ex executed action event, I'm closing up the others, that there is an elapsed milliseconds. So this was automatically added by ASP.NET. It logged it for us. But that means that I can come in and go, please show me anything where elapsed milliseconds are greater than five. And it'll go, sure. I can show you that the call to Swagger, the Swagger homepage did, uh, took longer. I can see that the action to get our weather uh, controllers get took longer. Okay. And I can see that the overall request finished up. And now five milliseconds isn't particularly slow. That's not the point. The point is, is that you could come in and go, give me everything that's taking longer than a thousand milliseconds. And all of a sudden you get the ability to look and interrogate for performance problems and raise your awareness level. We're moving from unknown to known by awareness simply by capturing the data that ASP.NET is already making available to us. Of all of these messages that were logged, only one of them, this one right here, I put in a log statement for. 
The rest were just brought in by plugging in Serilog to our framework and capturing it into SEC. That's it. So we get an amazing amount of data just by putting in the package. So step one, let's go home, make sure that our various projects are all running a structured logger so that, and that we're capturing and keeping that data because now we can ask that data questions. We live in a world where AI is doing more and more and more for us in the world of software. And it's important to remember that AI is driven on data. We can do amazing things in software if we have the data. Structured logging is an example of the data is available, but you might very well just be leaving it on the table. There might be log statements in ASP.NET that you're not even bothering to capture, and as such, you cannot analyze. So this is one of those moments where bothering to capture is so important because when I come in and go, where is your performance problem? With this, you'll at least be able to tell me my performance problem is in this controller method. This is where we're slow. Instead of, I don't know. That difference is everything. That difference can be weeks of engagement to the difference between getting logging set up, getting logging redeployed, waiting until the problems start reoccurring, examining the, the, the data once we've gathered enough of it. That is a significant difference in the cost of a, an engagement to get something fixed or the cost from a staff perspective to fix a bug if you, didn't, if you start with having the data yourself already. Now, but we're not done yet. The next thing I want to talk about is health checks. So if you're already running your code in containers, if you're running in Kubernetes, you may already be very familiar with health checks. If you're not, what a health check is, is a way for the system to convey to the outside world whether or not it is in a healthy state. You might be in an unhealthy state because you have thrown a bunch of exceptions, because you've lost connection to the database, because you've lost connection to queues that you need to be able to support. All of these things might be reasons why your code gets unhealthy. This, in a world of containers, this became something that we wanted to codify very much because of the fact that we wanted a container to be able to go, hey, I'm unhealthy and probably just need to be thrown away. Let's get a new uh, new container in here, see if essentially rebooting it will make things better. And so we created a standard for health check endpoints. And in this particular case, if we flip back to our running code here, and if we were to go to slash health, you will see that we get on this you, this local host slash health, we get a simple healthy response. This tells us that all is well, things are as they should be. Now, ASP.NET already handles the ability to know whether or not it's in a healthy state, to report out that via a infrastructure for managing health checks. And the way it does that is very simple. You just have to ask it for that health check endpoint. And you do so by coming in to your code and say, please use health checks and put them at slash health. So you decide where you want the route to be. Slash health is the default, but I put it here for clarity. Use and, and you say, please report health at this location. And that's it. You have done everything you need to do to make health checks happen just by saying, please expose it at this endpoint. And this allows your operational teams to be able to monitor this very fast endpoint to go, okay, things are still healthy, things are still healthy. Oh, things are not healthy. Maybe we should take action before it affects customers. Again, this is a matter of awareness of 
this is available to you. It's data that is provided to you by the framework itself, but you're probably not using today. Now, Health Checks has a companion called Liveness. Liveness really only matters in a container environment. So if you're using uh, a Kubernetes or other containerized environment, then by all means, you should also be running liveness checks. And liveness is about whether or not a particular process is ready to do business yet. We all know that oftentimes when software starts up, it has work that it needs to do before it's ready to actually do work. And the liveness checks are made so that the external uh, container management software like Kubernetes can be interrogating a process going, are you live yet? Are you live yet? Are you live yet? And it won't send traffic to a container until such time as it gets a liveness yes. Liveness is interesting, but if you're not using containers and if you don't have that sort of automatic management, then it's probably not something you're going to hand roll. So be aware that it exists. Be aware that it is almost exactly this simple to do uh, and to implement. But also, if you're not yet in a containered environment, it's less interesting to you right now. You're less likely to use that yourself. And before you say, oh, wait, I could wire that all up myself, don't. There are great people who are super smart who have solved this problem for you. Before you try to roll your own use, uh, use of liveness checks, look into Kubernetes, look into container management. That's the, the place and space to be for that. All right. So we've talked a little bit about the, uh, the minimal acceptable toolings for the first two. The last one I want to talk about is open telemetry. So if you're in the software world, you've probably looked at some level of telemetry work before. You've looked at New Relic, or maybe you've looked at AppDynamics from, uh, from Microsoft, and you've started to go, okay, I get it. There's this very low level per connection to the database level telemetry work that I could gather. It's lower level than you would ever want to log at because it's a lot of data. So it needs to be even more efficient than logging does. And yet it needs to relate back at a higher level to those things. And so there have been uh, there have been profilers essentially that plug in and gather this telemetry data for years. And New, New Relic has made their bones being a great product in this space. And as we've matured as an industry, somebody said, why isn't there a standard here? Why isn't there a way for me to expose to the outside world telemetry information that can be gathered up and not have to make my implementation of telemetry intrinsically coupled to a provider of telemetry analysis software? And out of this was born Open Telemetry. And it does an amazing job of being able to plug in. And so again, I'm here going to use an open source package by the name of Jaeger to, anal to look at information that was output at a telemetry level. Uh, and I have plugged in here and I've in in instrumented ASP.NET Core. I've instrumented the HTTP stack. And I'm saying, please export that to Jaeger. Um, I'm running Jaeger in Docker. So that's how we're going to go look at this. And so I've had Jaeger plugged into this the entire time. So just like I had my friend Sec here running and showing us all of the logs, while we were doing this, the Jaeger has been running the entire time too. And it now knows, oh, look, there was a uh, telemetry data sent to me from an unknown service named Measure Trice Code Once. And then I could say, find the traces for that. And it has looked at trace level information for all of the HTTP interactions that were going on for this. And it gives me a convenient graph that goes, these are the expensive things. And I could be like, what is that one up there that is took 150 milliseconds plus? 
And the answer is, oh, that was the pull up of the Swagger homepage itself, which required everything to warm up. It was the first thing that I requested. So that makes sense. So it's a statistical outlier, but nonetheless, it's there. Telemetry will plug in once you're doing database requests, once you're sending HTTP requests, it looks at the low level timings of all of these things. It can, yes, also come in and go, let me look at minimum durations, like show me only things where it's at least 50 milliseconds, okay? And there, that's all the things that are 50 milliseconds plus coming out of what we're doing. Again, Jaeger might not be your tool of choice. That's fine. There are lots of options that will consume this open telemetry information. Use what brings you joy. Use what align, aligns with your tech stack internally. But the real important thing is, are you capturing telemetry information at all? And if you're not, what look at what it takes to do that. Because implementing open telemetry took those lines of code right there. Actually, that was one line too many took those lines of code right there to to add open telemetry into this uh this framework a handful of lines of code added to the program.cs file of this web service and voila i had telemetry information being output i didn't have to touch every controller i didn't have to do anything more than just add some services in and they were instantly gathering the information and making it available to the Jaeger structure to report on. So again, this is how you have the awareness. How do I look at what my actual cost is? What is the most expensive part? How do I know what's costing me money in my cloud environment is driven from these types of interactions. So that gives us a fairly good look at what I consider the minimal acceptable tooling, structured logging, health checks, and open telemetry. If you're doing these three things, you at least are prepared for when there is a problem. You can identify where you might have problems. You can identify where over time that an endpoint has been getting slower and slower and slower because likely the data behind it has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we have the tools that we need to be able to look at a live running system and actually measure what is going on. All right, but none of that is measuring performance. It's measuring performance at a, at a macro scale. But I know a lot of you are like, but I wanna measure performance at a micro scale. And so, if you have identified that you have a performance problem in a particular area, now you have to examine performance at the micro level inside, whether or not something is faster or not at that, that micro level. And for that, I would like to introduce you to an amazing package named Benchmark.net. So Benchmark.net is a incredible tool for evaluating and comparing algorithmic complexity and performance in memory allocation, in total runtime, et cetera, of, of various ways you can accomplish the same thing. So in this particular example, we're about to look at here is doing a, a comparison between an MD5 hash and a SHA-256 hash. And so very simply, we create the two hash algorithms, we generate a, a variety of data that we're going to do, and then we stick the uh, random data into a data array that we're going to hash. Um, we're going to look at it from 1,000 to 10 and 10,000 entries in that byte array, and we're going to simply run that byte array through and compute a 256 hash, and we're going to compute an MD5 hash. Now, properly capturing memory allocations and timings 
is a complicated thing in .NET. You have to make sure that the framework is warmed up, that you're not jitting anything at the time. You need to make sure that you're in release mode, not debug mode, because of the fact that there are compiler differences when you're in release mode. And for all of these reasons, this, these are the things that Benchmark.net solves for us. You don't have to have all of that knowledge already in your brain. And if you want to go learn it, by all means, go learn it. It's wonderful and amazing. And I learned a great deal when I learned how to do these things. But instead, I can come in, look at this benchmark pro project here, look at our MD5 code here. And I'm going to make sure that our program is set up to run the MD5 test, which it was not. So in our program CS here, we're going to simply say benchmark runner, run that MD5 test. And that code looks exactly like what I showed you on the byte, uh, on the slide. We're going to create things. We're going to set up how many, uh, how many elements uh, we want in the array. And then we're going to be able to run a benchmark that computes a 256 and run a benchmark that computes an MD5. With these basic markings in that, we're going to now set this as the startup project, and we're going to tell it to run the benchmarks. Um, and da -da -da -da, using just sorry, I ran it with the debugger attached. That was my fault. I'm going to come in here, right click, and I'm going to start without debugging. Here we go. And at this point, the code is going to get compiled and executed by benchmark.net. And it's going to do all of the necessary work to do a trial run of it, to make sure that everything is jitted, everything is doing what it's supposed to do. And then we're going to actually do, so we do a warm up run, then we do the actual run. And then we're going to each, the next iteration, once again, do a warm up run, once again, do a, a actual run. All the while, it's gathering all of the data for us. So it is doing all of the necessary work to get statistically relevant information out of the comparison between these two algorithms. So it's done one of the algorithms now. It's doing the other one of the algorithms at this point. Uh, so it's probably doing the MD5 at this point. And when we're done, we're going to get a beautiful table that tells us about the differences that it has examined in performing these benchmarks. This is nitty gritty level information. We're getting information out. Here we are, we're done. We're getting information out about exactly how much memory was allocated, how much uh, Effort, how much was allocated to Gen Zero? What were the total time uh, in microseconds here for the mean the, based on the number of iterations the, um, or the number of elements, data elements here? So as we can see, the memory allocations are the same for each of those hashing algorithms, regardless of which type you used. MD5 takes less memory allocations. The SHA-256 took more, but at the level of more between 80 bytes and 112 bytes, not kilobytes, not megabytes, bytes. So there's a difference, but it's not a large difference. Um, and when you look though at the performance, we see that MD5 is a much faster hash overall. Having a mean runtime of 15 microseconds versus 38 microseconds at 10K worth of data put through it. All of this given to you in a nice clean report so that you can examine and go, is this better, is this worse? So when you're doing this type of performance, recommendations, keep your, your examples small, okay? Make sure that you've isolated a test scenario out of your main code. Do not run 
benchmark on your actual main code. Get it to the point where I have a hypothesis that this is my, my problem and I want to dig in to that to determine whether or not that hypothesis is correct. Examine it in isolation from the rest of your code. See if it performs and shows you what you expect from that hypothesis. Oh, Tim, by the way, yes. to pop in, but we, there's actually a question from Adam, and this is a great question right here. He says, is there anything interesting on the horizon for automatic .NET measurement coming now that we, official, that we have official Rosalind analyzer supports in, in the tools? Lies, annotation on steroids. <laughs> uh, so not that I have seen, and it's not a space. Rosalind analyzers, I find, are one of those spaces where we had a lot of excitement around it, and yet the complexity of doing it has resulted in a lot, not very many people digging in. And when we now look at where I expect most of the needle to be moved in performance and analyzing, I think you're going to far more likely see work done where AI is going to be watching and examining your data logs and come to you with, hey, you have a performance problem when a shape of a query or a shape of an inbound request looks like this, right? Then we see a degradation for, of performance of this level because that level of machine learning of, hey, what are the rules and what? how do I examine all this data and figure out where uh, where the outliers are is something that the machine learning space is very good at. And I expect that those tools layered into the open telemetry space and into the, into the logging space is where we're going to see the next big chunk of effort um, result in major changes to how we do all of this. And then that will most likely be tied into a, okay, you identified this problem, let's go make a recommendation to actually how to change to adjust for that problem, right? Um, and, you know, so then we'll see people start to tie performance analytics back to making code changes through tools like Copilot and otherwise, maybe even getting to the point where it opens a pull request and says, this is you have a performance problem that we've observed in your logs and we recommend making this change to address it and zero human involvement because of the fact that it knows all your uh, logging data because you kept all your data and you're capturing and have awareness because the awareness is not just for you it can be for ai algorithms as well and then it has knowledge of your code base through your git repositories or other source code repositories so that it can read your read your code and really move things forward and i think that given the sort of summer of ai innovation that we're in the midst of right now i think that that's where we're going to see more changes than we are going to see otherwise so this is an example here of the uh the necessary work to be able to do this analytic measurement at an algorithmic level so I just want to in, go into a little bit of closing here and go, if you're interested, I do a personal prize drawing every, uh, once a quarter for people who attend my talk. So if you want to snag this and fill out a survey for me, uh, I would love to get your feedback on the talk and we'll throw you into a prize drawing because of it. And uh, then the last thing I would say is that if you would like to see the code that I used today for this, um, my GitHub is uh, profile is github.com slash T Rayburn, T as in Tim, Rayburn is, is in my last name. And if you were to go and look at that, you will see measure twice code once as a repository on my, uh, on my profile. You can go grab all the code that I walked through today, see exactly how it is, and run all of this uh, yourself to see how it all turns out.
With that, I thank you all for coming, learning a little bit about uh, performance measurement in .NET today. Uh, and Henry, I will hand it back to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Tim. I like for the insightful talk and building, setting up, and identifying ways to enhance our application performance. Um, I think it was kind of funny. Shannon came in. And she says, "Like then AI will write the proposed code changes and merely let you know it made an update." <laughs> so sounds good. All right. Sounds good. Thank you guys, everyone, for attending this talk. Uh, so we're still going to leave it open for some questions. You know, thanks, Adam, for bringing that question up front. Um, we'll, we'll leave it for a few minutes for if anyone wants to even leave any comments on here as well, too. And of course, there's that survey that Tim actually put up there as well that is ready for sign up to get more feedback on the talk. So we'll leave it a few more, like a one to two minutes in case anyone has any questions that they want to ask for there. And please, everyone, be sure to come back next week. Uh, that We've got another great talk on cloud costs coming next week. So uh, we do these talks every Wednesday at noon. So be sure to check us out on a weekly basis. We've got improvers sharing knowledge all the time. And... Uh, and we love doing it and we love the interaction during our sessions. So it is appreciated. You got a bunch of thanks instead, Tim. So let me check out the lobby as well to ensure that I'm not missing anything from here. Okay. It looks like we're good, but well, thank you so much for the attendees for coming in. Thank you, Adam, 